Um, before we go into um, a discussion, I would like to give the floor to Antonio Granell uh, to sum up and give us some of his um, take-home messages that he, that he took. Um, Antonio, let me quickly introduce you. Um, professor Antonio Granell is a, a research professor at the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, where he is a group leader um, of the Plant Genomics and Biotechnology Lab. Um, he's also the scientific coordinator of the metabolomics facility and in charge of the mo of, uh, molecular breeding projects. Um, Tony leads and collaborates in numerous international consortia on tomato genetics, amongst them uh, Traditom, gp 2 Sol, and uh, most recently started the Hannes Tom project. And uh, he is one of the members of our TOMRES scientific advisory group. And as such, his words of wisdom will be listened to um, eagerly. <laughs> Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I really enjoy this nice selection of three talks that covers all these praxis uh, approaches, uh, from the very practical ones to more sophisticated, like this artificial intelligence. So I would like just to make a few comments and maybe ask questions to the one to each of the of the presenters. Uh, first is uh, is Pete. Uh, Pete, I really enjoyed this uh, because normally we don't involve this uh, systematic analysis of previous information in, in many of the projects because we rely that the partners, normally experts in the field, already have such information. But this show, your your work showed that. There is not so much work done specifically in combination of stress in tomato. So I, I was, I have, when, when every time I try to propose a, a project to a company, they all, I, when I, I ask them to do something on stress, they all, in, in tomato companies, say, oh, no, stress is not really a concern for us now, maybe in the future. Uh, and, uh, and maybe I don't know if this is the reason, maybe when you try to search for previous papers on combined stress and tomatoes, maybe may because scientists and maybe companies have not seen combined stress as a challenge, and this probably is reflected on the number of papers. And what, do you have any idea if maybe in open field, large crops like rice, corn, uh, wheat, these cereals that they have to grow out there with combined stress anyhow, because tomatoes, as far as a, my, the companies tell me, and uh, this is my uh, also my my experience. Are grown, for instance, in Almeria. It's a very dry place where they used to record Western movies. They don't no no rain, but they're still under water in wells. So they, they put the tomatoes in the under greenhouse conditions. They pump in water. They add fertilizer. So no no problem. No problem. It's only when we have sometimes in the summer a, a wave of heat, then we have an effect on fruit setting. But do you think there is something to do with this in the, in the impact on the, on the number of uh, papers that you have been successfully retrieving from the literature? I think it's a, it's a difficult, it's a very difficult question to answer. What I would look towards <clears throat> as an agroecologist is who, who, who has um, a system that delivers something approaching climate change tolerant crops? And the people that do that tend to be working with diverse crop mixtures and they're working with them in very different systems. Um, the difficulty is, without the commercial pressure to change, farmers who choose to operate in this very holistic way choose to do it for personal reasons. They quite often suffer a yield penalty in one particular year, but actually over the course of the rotation, have something more resilient. However, in one year, they can often be less profitable. So under the current pressures, there's no, there's no commercial or political impetus to make people crop more holistically. However, if tomatoes were suddenly priced according to their environmental cost, things would very quickly change. You know, so to, to me, the, there are systems out there that are better. They tend to work, to me, with crop mixtures, in, intercropping of various forms. And that could mean a genetically diverse mixture, but it could mean something in a diverse system 
with agroforestry or manures, you know, and, and, and integrated, lots of interventions integrated. So there's no quick answer. But without financial pressure to change, the commercial people will do what is most profitable, I feel, regardless of the impact on the environment. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Just another question for, not for you, for Panos. Panos, I uh, really enjoyed your talk also. And, and it, it has to do also with the economics. I mean, this is the, as, as, as Peter was telling, that this, there is the, the economics is underlying everything. And I think in the case of tomato, there is very low, it's very short margin. I mean, the, the, the producers, they have to, they cannot tolerate a 5% decrease in yield, okay? In the, and they always grow to the, under optimal conditions when they can do this. So you, you showed that there is a combination of things you can do at, uh, uh, to, to uh, in the case of uh, how you in, introduce either managing practice or biostimulant on plant uh, PGPR or AMF uh, as biostimulants. Mm -hmm. it's, and and you, you, you produce a number of recommendations no, or protocols for the farmers. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know okay. how you call this. Uh, it's, do you think this is something that they can use now to, to really boost production in, under a combined stress solution that is economically feasible? I mean, in the balance, because you mentioned, for instance, the green manure is uh, it's four kilos per square meter. Even, uh, mm -hmm. even something very cheap, four kilos per square meter, must be expensive when you, you only get four or five kilos of, of uh, tomato per plant and you have to pay for the seed. I don't know. So what is your understanding? And this maybe connects with the last presentation by uh, uh, Marco, uh, where he also mm -hmm. modeled the economics in it. Okay, uh, not only, not uh, all uh, the practices uh, are uh, sufficient regarding the costs. Uh, we try to test the different management practices regardless the cost. However, uh, for example, uh, chemical biostimulants, when we talk about uh, spraying the leaves only the beginning of the cultivation and uh, having a higher early yield, Mm -hmm. uh, this is very important for farmers uh, because the prices uh, for early production in the spring uh, are higher, prices are higher. So if a farmer have uh, early yield just uh, by spraying in the beginning of transplant transplanting, the beginning of uh, the crop, mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, an efficient way to apply the biostimulants. Uh, however, uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria who, who might need uh, further uh, applications uh, or do not have any uh, an, a, a clear effect on the yield uh, or uh, different rootstocks that may be too expensive. Uh, I, I also agree that uh, they're not uh, every time uh, affordable for the farmers. In the organic farming, uh, green manure uh, if the green manure can increase uh, about uh, one to two kilos per square meter tomato production, then um, the cost for the seeds for the legume plants is not so high. It's not so. Uh, it's not such a problem for the farmers. However, green manure needs uh, better planning, needs machinery. It's uh, yeah. It's it creates some uh, some difficult problems. Uh, however, uh, worms or uh, compost that can be found uh, uh, nearby our farms uh, or if we cultivate uh, uh, legumes as cash crop and we just uh, incorporate the stems, then we can have a benefit. We can also sell the legumes and then sell the tomato production, which would be higher. I think that integration is fine, but it's only that you, it's, it must be very difficult to convince farmers that for the added value of the crop, mm -hmm. they need to do uh, additional work. I mean, yeah, yeah okay. that's only my main concern. And, mm -hmm. and also the, the, the definition of all these biostimulants, so they, they, you must provide formulation that the farmers 
are very uh, they they don't need to do a master on biofertilization to to do it. I think this is a, adds an additional layer of complexity mm -hmm. because farmers are farmers are not biotechnologists are not specialists. I mean they they know their business, but the business they normally do. They, I mean it maybe to introduce too much change it must be difficult. Yeah, they don't they don't see the the because. The, the farmers, for instance, in South in Almeria, the, with the with the truck leaves the the compound. I mean, the the, the greenhouse in the, in the afternoon. They don't know where they're going in Europe. They are traveling north. Only on the way, the, the driver gets the information where the, the product is going to be sold. Okay, so mm -hmm. they, they are used to change, and they are very modern, and, and they, they probably will incorporate whatever makes sense for them to make more money. That's for sure. And in the challenges in the future of climate change makes them to change attitudes. But in the current situation, it must be difficult until they see the situation, ask them to change mm -hmm. for the problem. Okay. So I, thank you, Panos, and thank You're you. You're welcome. Uh, Mar Marco, uh, I just have a, a small question. It has to do with the... the uh, also, this, this to me is, is very complex. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on modeling, but I guess the, mod, the what I know about modeling is from an old professor that told me that all models are, are all models are wrong. Some models are, are useful. So the idea is that your models are have a predicted a predictive ability. You know? they can predict the outcomes when you you have some limited information. Is your model have your model been validated in in uh, in, in all the experiments or is still a model? So they have been validated. This is one of the questions. So all models have been validated. Uh, data mining models are validated by data, which are actually collected for the purpose of data mining. Uh, but when we make uh, when we build data mining models, of course we set part of this data aside. And then we make, we, make a, we make a model and then we, we took, when models are built, we took this part of data which were set aside and, and, we, value, and we use them for validation. So, and these percentages which I showed you there are these percentages. So in more than 70% percentages, all these predictions were correct, were right. Yeah, so, so your, is this kind of leave one, up, leave one out approach kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Ten, tenfold cross uh, validation means leave one out. Actually, leave ten percent of data out mm -hmm. and build a model on ninety percent and use these ten percent for validation. And for each model, uh, this procedure is repeated ten times. So uh, the data which are set out, these ten percent are uh, choose randomly, and mm -hmm. and it's a standard procedure how to validate data mining models concerning decision models. So uh, data mining models are models made on out of data, while decision models are models which are built out of knowledge of the experts which have been involved in the, in the, in the construction. So in our case, we actually used colleagues from the same work package, but from different tasks, because in the work package four, we have special task for environmental impact, special task for socioeconomic impact as well. Therefore, we used their uh, them them. Uh, I mean, these colleagues, and also we used colleagues from, I think, work package three, where Panos is sitting, and Jan, and and those guys who who really run ex experiments. So uh, we met and we constructed models out of knowledge. And later on, we asked um, asked actually project partners and and uh, those who, who use uh, who has uh, case studies to provide us their data from their fields. And we got this this data. We populated models with the real real life data, and the results are somehow consistent with their expectations. So which means that both data mining and decision models have been validated on a correct way. So on a, on a, on a way which is prescribed by the methodology. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Only that, that my, uh, so these models should work across locations, 
fields, trials, genotypes, all this complexity, or, or there are some restrictions? Because if you take the model, a few uh, data, data out of the model, and then you feed the model and predict this data, the results in, in from, and the complexity of the experiment is one field trial or, or several genotypes in this, and, and a, num a number of stresses, but in the same field trial. But have you validated this across trials, across years, across? So how robust do you think your model is? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the space unit uh, which, on which these models could be applied is a, a field or a, or a glass house. So, uh, I mean, you can compare you can compare results between different uh, locations and fields, but of course you have to calibrate models to this prop to these uh, fields and this uh, and this uh, glass house and properties of the glass houses. So so far we actually use background information uh, to to make more suitable interpretation of the results and in order to make reliable comparisons because if you would not respect background information this is for instance location altitude type of climate type of soil all this background information actually put into the frame into the content content the output which we got from the from the models but i mean in general the system is developed in such a way of course the, the goal of this project was to demonstrate that applying these methodologies uh, uh, allow us to to make reliable assessment of these three aspects of tomato production if you would like to go toward the commercialization of the product of course then we would need to invest much more time still a lot of work needs to be done that we will get to this tier, 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 L, tier LR uh, level of, um, of the product. But we, we said we, we developed here a prototype mm -hmm. which works. So the, the, the system itself has a, has, has, a, is, is, uh, has a can be used actually anywhere if you uh, and af after the calibration and the calibration is actually very simple because you have to because we work with qualitative uh, decision models. So the most important thing here is that you set up the threshold values for numeric attributes on the right way, uh, which means because uh, pH, uh, low pH has different meaning in Greece compared to, to, to Germany. Mm -hmm. So the thresholds are different and we, with, with adjustment of the thresholds actually for this utilization of input data, we actually uh, make uh, calibration of the model. But internal rules, aggregation, and all these kind of things will not change until the general knowledge and, and understanding of these uh, properties will not change as well. Of course, Pete has collected so much uh, publications now let's say about 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 these aspects if we would go and and we assume that the structure of our models is more or less at the same level as knowledge which is published there but after five years of course knowledge will improve and that will need and that will i mean if we, if we would still work on these models then we would need to implement this knowledge back into the structure of the, of the of the systems in order to, to keep them uh, at the state of the art uh, about the knowledge. Again, these models are models which are actually using knowledge. So they are not to, to make, to test hypotheses or something like this, like mechanistic models. But yeah. decision models are actually really models which help you to make a more reliable decision. Okay, thank you, uh, and thank you all. I, I mean, uh, Andreas and Hannah. I, I'm sorry, I have to leave you now with the open discussion. I have another commitments in uh, five minutes, so thank you very much. I really enjoyed your workshop, and I wish you the best for this final part of the of the project. Okay, and I will be in touch for sure. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye. Uh, Bye.
Antonio, before you leave, maybe I can ask everybody to quickly turn on their camera Thank so you. we can take a group photo, a screenshot before one or the other disappear. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, so that we can, can see you quickly and then you can turn off your camera again after a short while. We'll just take a screenshot now. Simona is also doing a duplicate um, in case I lose some information here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us, uh, Antonio, for the workshops. Thank you for sharing everything with me. Bye bye. See you okay. tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Right. Okay. Now I would like to invite um, the other participants to. Uh, ask some questions, make some contributions uh, to our three speakers, uh, if you wish. Um, please, if you would like to speak, just raise your hand or write a question into the chat, uh, whatever you favor. I have a question, I have a question, yes. an awkward question from Marco. <clears throat> Marco, I think the, the DSS is great. But I'm going to say something um, controversial. How could we make them more accessible? Yeah, I feel that if they could be marketed better, more people would use them. And to me, it's about making them consumer ready or user friendly. Is, is that possible to make them easier for the, a general person to use? I would I would make a difference between what is user friendly and what is accessible mm. and what is trustable. So um, as I wrote as we wrote in the in the deliverable, so the the, the final I mean really final touch of decision modeling is still going on. So we we will have uh, the first operational. Uh, uh, version of the DSS ready on Friday, and uh, and of course this will be developed in a way that will be user friendly. And by the end of the project, the DSS will be accessible uh, through Tomres' uh, web page, and everybody could could have a look and and and, and check it and, and play with it. Another issue is to make it applicable and trustable for the end users. Um, as I mentioned before, I mean, there are still plenty of work to do until you come to the level of development that could be uh, offered as a, as a product product to, uh, to, the, to, to, to the end users. Uh, so I would say that this is a little bit custom made uh, product. So we would need to, of course, to consider uh, specifics of the end user. So for instance, what type of the production, where, what's the size, what's the problem. So in most of the case, I, I'm, I'm sure that the structure of the model will stay the same because uh, we inbuilt current level of knowledge about this phenomena in the structure. But we will need to, of course, to calibrate, uh, calibrate model to, to, to the application I mean, to the area where it will be applied. And this is done by uh, selection of right or correct uh, threshold values. As, and, as, as, and you know by yourself that this was not easy task at all, how many times we met and discussed uh, which, what, which pH is, could, is low and, and what is the threshold and et cetera, et cetera. So this is, one uh, one one task that has to be done before it it could be used by anybody. So calibration to the area where it will be applied, and then of course there is another very technical but very important issue. First of all, when you offer a tool to be used, of course, then you need to provide all technical support, which means you need to have somebody who who will take care about the system somewhere in some at some institution at some server then it has to be because the server is updating 
and uh, and and and, and the, the, the machinery behind has to be updated as well. Then uh, then you need to take care about language. Of course, you cannot sell English version to Greece, Greek colleagues, so you have to translate it. Then you need to take care about tutorial and user manual uh, and all that kind of thing. So a lot of still a lot of work, not very demanding, but also, but uh, this work requires a lot of time. And also it requires specific knowledge and experiences, which we as a researchers usually don't have. So fortunately in our group for development of decision support system, we have a, a graphical designer and somebody who studied philo uh, psychology. So all this kind of knowledge, knowledge is, 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 is required in order that you get user-friendly and uh, uh, user-friendly interface and that, uh, and uh, this user and, and, and which will make the uh, user experience uh, also uh, high or good or, you know, that, that, that kind of things. Yep. Sounds like we need a follow on project to Tomlis, Andrea, where we, <laughs> where we then collaborate with some uh, SMEs or companies that can bring yeah. Decision support system onto the next level. Usually, usually that kind of that kind of partners uh, can can can. But believe me, I mean they will still need to invest a lot of time and money into a product before the product will be ready for. for, for it, to, to me, it's interesting from the outside that the DSS can be used in different ways. It can be used for academics. It can be developed for consumers. To me, one of the greatest applications is actually for education. And actually, you can start looking at the impacts and trade-offs of different approaches. You can scenario, you can scenario build, and for me, that's probably where its greatest value lies, is and and just in creating more awareness about the food systems and the impacts, you know, farm to fork of your consumer choice. Um, but you're right; it still needs to be made accessible. You still need somebody to communicate it. But um, yeah, I, yeah, it's yeah the users, are not just, users are not just farmers and advisors. I mean, very important group of users are students because you can very easily disseminate knowledge about this uh, phenomena by discussing the structure of the model itself. Because in this structure, this is just structure of the knowledge and you can very easily disseminate all this knowledge to students. And then students can can play and 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 with with different ideas, different scenarios, they can search for different options. I, th I think even even in, very fast. even in schools, Marco. I don't. I think uh, the way things are moving, consumers are becoming far more food literate, and and they're trying to teach food literacy, or food system literacy at school, even in your quite young students. So to me, this, is, this could be a great tool developed for mainstream education, even pre-university. It could be tremendous. If, obviously, it needs adapted and, and changed, but nevertheless, as an educational tool, as a thinking tool, I, I think it could be quite powerful, particularly with regard to that. Can I just interrupt you, Pete? Sorry. Sure. Uh, Andrea, Andrea needs to leave. And I would like to give him the chance to say a couple of final words before he disappears, and then we can continue to discuss, maybe. Andrea, if you're still there, maybe you can say a couple of words. Yes, I am. Yes, uh, well, uh, <laughs> yes I have to go for another minute. For, uh, well, I see there's a lot of discussion. This is very good. Less presentations this time and more discussion. So. I see that's interesting what we are doing, not only within <laughs> our project. So I wish to thank you all for, for giving these contributions and I hope to see you soon, of course. Um, we have to work together for closing the project in a short time. Bye-bye, see you. Bye, Andrea. Thanks for being here. Thank bye you, Bye. Anna. Right. Okay, sorry, uh, Pete, that I cut you short. Um, no, no, that's okay, no problem. <laughs> No, I was just contributing to the discussion really. I just think that the, the potential of the DSS is high. 
I mean, I'm putting myself, I've got my agroecology hat on, but, you know, I, I, I just see some crazy choices by farmers and by consumers because they're poorly informed. You have farmers that don't manage nitrogen, don't manage their soils well. Consumers that make poor choices in terms of, you know, let's say nutrition and health. So, uh, it, it, it seems to me that um, people are just busy reacting. They're almost passive. Um, and really it's because they're not informed. Mm. They're, they're not informed of the true cost. I'm not just talking true cost in terms of money, the true cost of their food production, mm. but actually a tool such as a DSS used for general education of the general population could be quite useful to help food system literacy. Now, if people were better informed, if, for example, if somebody knew that their potatoes needed pesticide every eight days, would, would their consumption choice change? It might well do. You know, and there's a lot of learning, learning things like that. Uh, very simple things, but the consumer's just not getting them. But they could be trapped in a DSS in, in a way that could be used for mainstreaming education. I mean, to me, it's really important. I don't think the system can change unless people are informed. And then the question is, how do you inform them about, you know, the food, the food system and the pressures it's under? Mm -hmm. Certainly mm -hmm. element of systems approach. Right. Um, are there any other questions or contributions to any of the speakers? So maybe I would have a question. Uh, First of all, thank you very much for these great three presentations uh, and uh, all your outcomes you presented concerning tomato production, as you already discussed, Pete and Marco, concerning DDS uh, and also uh, concerning the systematic map and considering the idea to um, yeah, get these general um, concepts also into universities. Would you consider that it might be an appropriate idea to have some general setups to collect data as long as I interpret your presentations concerning data mining and also uh, studying all these yeah, different studies to, to select all the necessary information. Would it be helpful to have a general concept giving handing to farmers to um, universities to collect information so that they have a more easy access to um, yeah, um, data support system or to, to this general map, getting this all to a, a sum up um, yeah, question answering all the, the uh, experimental uh, questions that can be yeah, collected. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've, I've no easy answer for you. Oh, of course, of course, it's not an easy answer. Maybe it's more a summary, the getting all uh, this into. To certainly, from my point of view, that there's a there's. It's curious watching our knowledge and innovation systems. In that much of our our knowledge and innovation systems serve a diversity of functions. Yeah, some are people just wanting papers, they're doing science that I would liken to very fine art. Others are people doing science that's very applied. Um, and they don't have equal pressure for publications either. Some people don't really care about publications and they're heading straight towards application. Other people are really just only concerned about applications. And then in amongst all this, we have policy makers saying, what about climate change? And what about nutrition? And, you know, what about health? Um, I, I personally, with, with respect to the system assessment, the, the systematic map, I think we need an appraisal of, our, appraisal of our knowledge and innovation systems. To me, they're being asked to do everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I would question what they're delivering. Not that they're not delivering, they are delivering, they're delivering on a lot of fronts, but I wouldn't say they're necessarily just, you know, if we're in a climate emergency and I look at our knowledge and innovation system, I don't see that the urgency is reflected in we're, what we're prioritizing. It could be that we're going to touch upon the DSS and Marco can pick this up. For example, 
would people be more likely to accept GM if they knew the true environmental cost of their food? Well, probably they would. You know, so to me, it all comes down to um, greater transparency and being honest about what we're doing with our science objectives. That's not to say one is good and one is bad. Quite often, you don't know the value of a science piece of science. You know, somebody was working on retroviruses at one time. I'm sure somebody said, why the hell are you doing that? You know, and then suddenly AIDS appears and it's, you know. So I think everything has its value. But if we're in a climate emergency, to me, the, the knowledge that people are gathering doesn't always relate to the emergency that we're meant to be in. But Marco. <laughs> But in general, would it be helpful to have a, a fact sheet or something like that handed out by journals so that you really have to give all the experimental details on an yeah, uh, easy overview that might help you both to collect all the necessary information? I think that, I mean, that's being done in a way. We're moving towards it. In terms, of we have the you know a, a Tom Res database, and we trap the methods, and we trap the data sets that are gathered. But my impression is that the EU is going to move more strongly towards that as time goes on, anyway. And that actually, it will be part of the grant award that you have to st store not just your finances in a way that can be audited, but you store your data in a way that can be audited. So I think that is slowly coming anyway. They're not dropping us into it legally all at once, but I think that, that will become standard. But you still have another issue. Who's going to really look at that data and who has the time to mine those data sets? <laughs> maybe, maybe at this junction we can take uh, a question that came in through the chat. Um, what about the next step? Dissemination of your model, thus including centers for formation and education. So that goes into that direction, you know, what comes next, you know, how, how can you disseminate the, you know, the information and the models? Do you, do you want to give an answer, Marco? Yeah, this, this, this question uh, shows up uh, anytime at the end of such projects like uh, Tomer's. So, of course, we can, we can publish a paper, but this paper will just describe tool and people of course who, who will read the paper would probably like to get some experience with the tool itself. Uh, so I mean I think that we have to think about this what's coming next or after the project before we start the project at the time when we actually write the project proposal already then we have to foresee what will happen after. Because uh, experiences are such that when the project is finished, uh, I mean, project partners, they go, um, they disappear. Everybody has its own project. And those who are responsible for these DSS systems, we are, we are still very much involved in the action. So we, we, we are like a parents. We, we have to keep care of our kids. Mm -hmm. We have to nurse them. We have to, to keep them safe. We have to buy new clothes. It means we have to maintain server software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have to be all the time available for anybody who would call and ask uh, either for some explanations or it happens also that sometimes uh, system uh, blocks and and people call and say, "Oh, it doesn't work. Would you like to look what's going on?" So it means it means some 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 partners or project partners yeah, will will stay active and uh, with this tool with this tool also after the official end of the project but i don't complain about it i would just like to use the i mean like peter like peter already mentioned i mean uh, we have to use this uh, opportunity and potential to explore this kind of tools further on i mean to develop like uh, them toward the as education to a education tool or to be used uh, uh, for labeling of products or something something else but uh, we have to foresee of course uh, i think that kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. that kind of actions before we begin with the project or we have to find a solution 
during the project. It's always too late to start thinking about this at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, yeah, words of wisdom. <laughs> Are there any other questions by any of the of the listeners? I had a quick question for panels. A quick question and a quick yeah. question. Well, I should know this panels, but I don't. How much nitrogen is normally added to tomatoes in a field? Uh, in a field, yes. Uh, about uh, uh, from uh, 200 to uh, 500 uh, kilograms per hectare. I mean, that's massive. That's yeah. a massive amount of nitrogen. Uh, I'll, put it, I'll put it into perspective. So from an arable point of view, an arable crop, you'd add about 90 to 100 kilograms of nitrogen. So it's five times more than you might add to a cereal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if it's something like oats, oats would be something like, I'm just wanting to let people know that's a massive amount of nitrogen. Yes, yes. And it's, and it's curious to me that half of that will be lost, probably. It won't even make its way to the plant. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess there's little pressure on the farmers to manage their landscape to mop up that excess nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, to me, that's, that's just amazing. I mean, I, I laugh when I hear those levels of nitrogen. I shouldn't laugh. It's just an alternative to crying, really. Um, but that's a massive amount of nitrogen. That's yeah. 250 kilograms per hectare disappearing. Um, okay, so I just wanted to be, to be clear about that. The only other people I know adding those levels of nitrogen are some people in China <laughs> in really you know, not very nice locations. But um, you said that the common bean wasn't as good as the cowpea and the faba as a green manure, mm -hmm. which is, I guess that's just because common bean is a smaller plant. It, yes. It, yeah, yes, it's maybe. just, it doesn't fix as well either. Because actually common bean needs, right. needs nitrogen added to it. Whereas yes. the cowpea exactly. and the faba bean doesn't need any nitrogen added to it. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah. I guess lupin would be quite good as well. That, that, yes, of course. Yeah. So then, no, I'm just, I'm just wanted to make sure that my understanding was, um, was correct in that regard. Yeah, and maybe this is one for, for Greece and other people. Why aren't there lot? You know, in arable systems around Europe, there's quite a few long-term experimental platforms for arable systems, some stockless, some with, with animals. I've not heard of a long-term fruit or veg rotation. Yes, uh, no, in, uh, in Greece, uh, 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 most of farmers uh, cultivate a single crop all the time, mm. uh, know very well about this crop and do not uh, uh, crop rotate. But uh, this is also due to, uh, in Greece, we do not uh, crop very much uh, wheat, barley, or uh, legumes in uh, very extensive areas, in very large areas. So uh, people do not, know, do not apply crop rotation like, uh, like Europe does, yeah. like other countries of Europe. But uh, nevertheless, you have the opportunity as a scientist, as a researcher, perhaps with the money or with the facilities to establish a, a sustainable or at least a platform, a sustainable crop or vegetable rotation. Mm -hmm. It seems to me um, that that possibility is, is there, but nobody, like I said, there's people doing it certainly for legume supported arable rotations, but not or taste, but I, I, to me, there's a there's a there's a gap in the market there. Yeah, not yeah. just for tomatoes, but also for perennial fruit systems as well, because a lot of the perennial fruit systems can actually harvest carbon quite well. They mix quite well with agroforestry. I don't know if tomato systems might also mix well with carbon. But a, a new market that's emerging for farmers is the carbon sequestration market, and we forget about that, but. At the moment, people are trading carbon. You know, there's chartered accountants trading carbon. So if you can have a cropped system 
that can yield and be profitable. You can also gain money for trapping carbon. Mm -hmm. It's another source of income. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's just something to think about. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I thank you very, very much for the uh, very uh, rich discussion. Um, Lutz, Lutz has his hand raised. Lutz has <laughs> a very, very last question. And a quick one, please, because we're already 10 minutes above time. <laughs> it's not a question. It's a comment. Um, thanks for the research. I like to disagree with um, the answer that you have to plan in advance um, what is coming up um, with uh, project results. Also, at this time point of view, or at this time, you can calculate roughly how much will it cost to run the program or the DLS for two years, infrastructure, personal, and then you can sell it either to private companies or to environmental um, departments. Because otherwise, you just stay where you are, uh, where you are, and there's no benefit. There is no putting into practice by the farmer. That's my comment to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, comment very well taken. Thank you very much. And thank the speakers very much for their contributions and for sharing their, their results. Very impressive uh, work that has been carried out over the past three years uh, in the project. Uh, thank you very much for the participants. Some of them had already um, to leave us. We had, we had more uh, during the, uh, the presentations. Um, Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for contributing to a very rich discussion today. Um, I will um, circulate the list of participants to everybody. So you have uh, uh, the links if, in case you want to say anything, you want to communicate with any of the others, especially for those outside of the Tomras Consortium. And um, we will make the recordings of the presentations available eventually on uh, the Tomras website as well. Thank you very much, everybody. And bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.